Okay. Very good. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's set the atmosphere here. Yes. We are at the Nighthawk Cinema in Williamsburg. I just presented a screening of Snowden, Oliver Stone's Is latest that right? film. Yeah, on opening <laughs> night. And uh, now we're sitting on a sidewalk, in a, at a table in a sidewalk uh, area outside of the uh, bar in the basement of the theater. That's right. So if you hear sounds of, which is inevitable, sirens, trucks, honking, it's going to happen. We're on Metropolitan Avenue, which is, uh, yes. you know, almost at the very end here, though. We're right, right almost at the edge of uh, the borough, we're right at the river. So it's a nice, uh, it's a lot of hipsters it's known for. It's right? ground zero for hipster culture in the U.S., yes. Right, I, I guess that's the way to put it. Sitting with uh, Matt Zollersites, who is the, he is the editor-in-chief of RogerEbert.com. I should mention, I, I told you already that I just posted an interview with Whit Stillman just minutes ago. Yeah. As when he said he had to, like, a, you know, a certain time that he had to kind of end it. And I told him when it was 6 o'clock. And he, he said, uh, oh, thank you, because I have to go meet a very important critic, Godfrey Cheshire. Oh, and I've who known... Who is your colleague. I've known Godfrey. Not only is Godfrey my colleague, he is my mentor. He's one of my mentors. Really? Yeah, he's as important to me as Roger Ebert was. Is that true? Yeah, Godfrey uh, started at New York Press, I believe, in 1990. Yep. And uh, in 1995, I moved to New York from Dallas, Texas, and I had been writing for the Dallas Observer, which is an alternative news weekly there. And um, I, I got a job at the Star-Ledger in Newark as a popular culture columnist, mm-hmm. which was sort of a catch-all thing. And I saw uh, a notice in the weekly New York Press that they were looking for an, another film critic, and so I submitted my clips. And Godfrey liked my clips, and we had a meeting, and he uh, hired me. This was like so, in the early 90s? This was 1995, November wow. of 1995. So my, my first job as a New York film critic, Godfrey hired me. And ever. we've been friends ever since. He's really a great guy. He is. And he, I did a screening with him once of Moving Midway. Oh, yeah. His documentary, which is about the history of his family in North Carolina. On the, on the macro level. Yes. Uh, and moving it specifically. The story is about how their family plantation, which has been in the family for, you know, 150s. I don't even know how long. Generations. Uh, it had to move because the interstate highway was uh, right. widening. Right. And it, rather than... Uh, tear down the plantation they physically moved it like a half a mile back away yeah, yeah on the road <laughs> yeah it's an incredible and in the process of this he uh, wanted to do a film about uh plantation culture and racism in the old south and how it shaped uh mm-hmm. white and black people and in the process of doing this he contacted an african-american historian in new york as oh, an right. expert witness and right. and he discovered along the way Amazing. that they were distantly related they were cousins they were distantly related that's right one of the relatives came to the screening i forgot i have uh, let's go to the videotape no I, I it's amazing it's an amazing it's a, it's like one of those it's it's one of those charmed documentaries which you know where just you, there's a certain amount of uh, serendipity you know it's like I love the documentary where the, the filmmaker, in this case, is, this is a movie Midway doesn't really apply, but I love the documentary where the filmmaker thinks they're doing a film about su- some subject, but something comes in and rail, railroads it or whatever the, the, yeah. the expression is. They, it just changes the entire trajectory of the story, and it becomes yeah. something else which is even more fantastic. And Well, one of, my, one, one of my favorite uh, examples of that is uh, Ross McElway, who's also from North Carolina, right. and his, and his, his breakthrough documentary, Sherman's March, mm-hmm. 1986, I want to say. Right. He went out to, uh, he, well, he was single, right? And he well, to- he, what he wanted to do was, the documentary was supposed to be him retracing the steps of Sherman's March to the Sea during mm-hmm. the Civil War. Mm-hmm. But at some point along the way, his girlfriend broke up with him, <laughs> and it became yeah. him visiting ex-girlfriends and interviewing them to find out why girls keep breaking up with him. Yeah. <laughs> I had it kind of backwards. I started with the... Well, I'm proud to say Godfrey has been on twice, and uh, Ross has been on too. So, you know, you're an That's amazing great. company. I love, what I, I love this thing. It's like such an, a great... Um, Opportunity, I guess. You know. His film, Ross McElwee's documentary, Bright Leaves, mm. which is about the, the history of tobacco in the South, right. business and cultural history of tobacco, mm-hmm. is a great, not only a great movie, but also uh, uh, a great companion piece to Godfrey's documentary, Moving Midway. Mm-hmm. And, and if, I, if I ran a theater, that's, I would show the two of them on a double feature. Yeah. 
You, it's, uh, have you done much curating on the, while on this? Not, not officially. I mean, I have, I have suggested films uh, or film series, mm-hmm. and, and various venues have shown them, and I've introduced them and done Q&As and interviewed directors and things, including one that I did with uh, Oliver Stone back in 2011 for the Museum of the Moving Image. Mm-hmm. I invited him to screen Nixon, the director's cut of Nixon, and the, the third cut of Alexander, which is the first one that he was happy cut. with. Yeah, um, and I've shown you know the films of Wes Anderson in a lot of different places. I've done uh, programs with uh, conspiracy films and zombie films and other kinds of films that I like. <laughs> We're going to get to more about Oliver Stone in a minute because that's the the uh, raison d'etre here. But I interrupted myself. Uh, Matt Zoller Sites is not only editor in chief of RogerEbert dot com, but is it possible that you're also the TV critic for New York Magazine and Vulture, which is their blog? It's and yeah, I do that too. I do that how too. How do you do that? Well, well, no, I for one possible? thing, um, because I am not the only film critic at RogerEbert dot com. I don't have to see everything. Okay. I, I review probably a hundred or a hundred and ten films a year for RogerEbert dot com, um, but we have a. a we have a staff of you know probably five or six regular critics and and another few uh, who do like one or two a week, uh, one or two a month rather. Mm, okay. Well, there's a uh, Sheila O'Malley, Odie Henderson, um, Glenn Kenny, Susan Wazinska, um, Scout Tafoya, Scout. Godfrey Cheshire right. is in the rotation. Yeah, uh, Scout, Scout, Scout and Godfrey did it for the New York, uh, once we just chatted about the New York Film Festival. This is about two years ago, yeah. And uh, Angelica Jade Bastien, who I think is incredible. i got to get back and start. Really, yeah. yeah. How involved is Ch- Chaz? Chaz, uh, is, Chaz is, he, is very involved for a person who is, you know, <clears throat> basically running the family business. Mm-hmm. You know, Ebert, uh, Ebert Digital is the parent company of RogerEbert.com, and, they, and of course, the, they, the website is theirs. But they're also doing things like they're they're managing the rights to Rogers Reviews. They're putting out books, including uh, The Great Movies 4, mm-hmm. which I believe uh, just came out or is about to. Mm-hmm. I wrote the introduction to that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they also are developing, um, they're trying to develop a new television series. Uh, is that right? Yeah, there's something, you know, that is kind of Ebert-esque. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know where they are with that exactly. And uh, and also, Chaz is a pretty important person in the film world. I mean, she, she goes to film festivals, and she, uh, she she does dispatches. I mean, she goes to Cannes. She goes to, you know, other film festivals, and she files reports. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's a really one of the best publishers I've ever worked for because Chaz, the thing I love about Chaz is the same thing I loved about Roger, which is um, the Eberts never... And, uh, you know, neither of them, and now Chaz, ever tried to turn anybody into them. Mm-hmm. You know, Roger always Not had an appreciation. Time. Yeah, no, Roger mm-hmm. always had an appreciation for whoever the critic was, and he wanted you to be the best you that you could be. You know, I'm not the same kind of critic that Roger was, and, you know, uh, and he never wanted me to be that. And he, and he actually had a great eye for talent. I mean, you know, a lot of the people that... A lot of the people who are critics now of some significance are people that Roger um, nurtured. Yeah. You know, like yeah. uh, Sheila O'Malley is, is one that I think is just terrific. And, and uh, Sheila writes about acting. Her focus is acting. Okay. And so she'll, yeah, and she'll, mm-hmm. do a, she'll do a review of movies. And, you know, a lot of movie reviews never write about acting. It's true. I mean, certainly a lot of documentary reviews don't. Yeah. And, the, and <laughs> well, certainly the... Um, the process, you know, like yes. somebody might say, in a searing performance, and that's all they'll say about the acting. Oh, they'll say a very fine, yes, Matt Damon. Yes, or, exactly. Know, you know, there's yeah. a certain lexicon that it's. I don't want to say it's lazy, but it's not unusual. To say, yeah, to say and crazy. and Sheila doesn't do that. And if you read a Sheila O'Malley review, it's the acting that's the way in. Mm-hmm. She talks about the filmmaking too, and she talks about the issues surrounding the film if there are any. But that's her way in. Gotcha. And uh, and Odie, I love Odie because Odie is, I think, probably the most sheer fun of anybody in the regular rotation. Mm-hmm. He's definitely the funniest. Mm-hmm. You know, he's 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 got a sense of humor. He's a great, just a great joke teller. And you know, there's setups and punchlines in his paragraphs. But he's also a very serious dude. Mm-hmm. And he and he, um, I love it when he reviews. He's African American, and I love it when mm-hmm. he reviews films with predominantly black casts right. because he will bring an authenticity to that that a white dude. Or white woman will not. Yeah, I heard recently on um, Film Spotting, which I listen to regularly too. Uh, I think he was on there, if I'm not mistaken, talking about the Obama Michelle uh, uh, movie, that special weekend, wherever it's called. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
speaking of writing and, and all, this is our second night in a row. We were both working at uh, this event last night at uh, the Film Society Lincoln Center, Walter Reed Theater, around all screening for Oliver Stone's movie Snowden, which, you know, I'm very still haven't seen, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I forfeited that tonight just to hang out with you, which I'm... And I'm, and I'm honored. I'm no regrets. <laughs> I'm really excited to talk to you. I've really wanted you on for a long time. Yeah. And then uh, you have a book just happened to come out exactly at the same time so called the oliver stone experience which yes. is a according to sources you six pound hardback coffee table it's a coffee table it's not even a coffee it's a coffee table, table. it's an in actual fact, literal it's, coffee it's, it's table actually heavier than most coffee tables <laughs> <laughs> i defy you to go to to uh you know ikea and find something heavier than this book but yeah it, it, one of the reviews of the book described it as a 480 page hardback book that could kill you but it's glorious. I mean, if you're, if you're, it's like every time we talk about Oliver Stone's career, I, I, I rem- reminded of another movie that he made that just kind of I've forgotten, like you know, or at least one. Uh, so you know, he has such a rich and full career, and and as a most long career artists like himself, directors, there has been some crests and valleys or what have you want to call it, but he seems to be rounding up uh, to coming up on another crest, which is well, I, I think, think so. I think so, and he just turned 70. Yeah, and yesterday. Yeah, correct? yeah, when this was September together? 15th, was Oliver Stone's 70th birthday, and the event at the Lincoln Center, they presented him with a birthday cake, and mm-hmm. everybody sang happy birthday to Oliver Stone, Yeah, and uh, which is a completely surreal. I can't, still can't get over how surreal the entire thing is that I've spent so much time with him, and I consider him a friend. I can never yeah. review, I, I feel like I can never review his movies again officially. Uh-huh. I, I'll certainly write about them, but I'll always say oh, my friend You're Oliver. Right. You, you, yeah, well, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, I was at his house. I've been, I've spent time at his house. I've hung out with him, and you know, he's he'll like call me when he's where is he when he's feeling like depressed or really? or upset or something. Like he was at the Toronto Film Festival, and he was really nervous before the press conference, and he called me at like seven o'clock in the morning. And he just wanted to talk to me about. Basically, I give him pep talks sometimes. You him off the ledge. Yeah, I kind of do, and and he's yeah. honestly he's done that for me too. Really, it sounds strange, but yeah, it's weird. And he'll like give me, you know, he's counseled me on my wardrobe. He he thinks he thought that I was poorly dressed, and he advised me to dress better, and made some suggestions, you know. He and a, uh, I noticed last night because the first I saw him once from a distance at Doc NYC, I think a couple years ago when he had that, you know, the the real America, you know, the underbelly kind of version of of history of the United States, and I not unintentionally include Howard Zinn in that right, right. expression but 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 it was like a kind of a a, a, a companion to that i uh, that work yeah. and he was at Doc and Moise and I saw him from a distance certainly very charismatic but last night i noticed even at, oh my god this guy looks great yeah he really does you know he's got his he's got a style and yeah he does and he's also in great shape for a 70 year old guy very good. i got i got to hand him that Easily and especially looks. when you consider the kind of life that he's lived you know, he, part, he partied pretty hard for, you know, I would say until well into his late 40s yeah. uh, when he met his cur- his uh, third wife, Chun, and settled down. Is that the young lady that was there last night? She's, well, it's great. You know, he would love it that you called her a young lady. She's 61. I don't know. I just. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because he's really in love with her. He's really, he dotes on her. And I'll never forget, it was the third or fourth interview I did for the book. We were at his apartment mm-hmm. and she came home. This is his apartment in New York, and she came in while we were talking, and she went into the kitchen, and she made tea for herself, and she brought two cups of tea to me and Oliver and set them down and gave him a hug, and he kissed her, hmm. and they, you know, exchanged, uh, you know, lovey-dovey pleasantries, and then she walked away, and he turned to me and said, isn't she beautiful, Matt, and doesn't her voice sound like music? Wow. <laughs> this is the warmer and fuzzier. It was corny. It was Oliver extremely cor- it was extremely corny. And you know, he's not al- he's not always cares. like that. I mean, yeah. he's you know, there've been times honest to god and I'm sure he'd say the same thing about me where um I didn't like him very much. You know, he can be very he can be um defensive. Um he can be volatile and you know, he thinks that I'm uh he thinks that I'm uh, easily scattered and distracted, which is true. Mm-hmm. Um, and it bothers him that I haven't read as much history as him. He's constantly giving me books. I have probably 20 or 30 books that Oliver Stone has given me. It's both in- interesting. It's kind of both insulting and, uh, <laughs> you, you know, generous at the same time. Well, I don't see it that way. Yeah, I mean, know, I, I, I'm kind of... In- I like that he's concerned. Yeah, I, I like that he's concerned about yeah. my continued personal development. Yeah, yeah. I think it's great, and I have learned a lot. I have yeah. learned a lot, and and you know, I, the one of the first things I learned, because I have over a hundred hours of recorded mm-hmm. interviews with Oliver, 
and then there was probably twice that number of hours where we were just hanging out and and uh the every conversation i've ever had with him has begun with him discussing whatever happened today or yesterday in the news mm -hmm. and he subscribes to google alerts and he would have to turn his phone off when we talked because these google alerts are coming in continuously and he's got you know the new york times the wall street journal um you know i don't even know what else probably mother jones i mean like yeah. he, he he subscribes nation, to, you know yeah associated that, press right. and totally it's not right. just his, it's not about like you know a lot of people have google alerts about themselves and their movies but he's like he wants to know what's going on in russia he wants to know what's going on in vietnam mm -hmm. what's going on with new york uh, with the uh, uh, american trade policy and uh the elections and all of but this that's stuff that's what i was going to ask you now uh, maybe you had since you you've had his ear what does he say about trump i mean it's obvious what he feels. I mean, I'm going to guess that he just thinks this is the biggest perpetrator. Uh, well, he, he thinks Donald Trump is an idiot. And he, and he knew that he's known this for a long time because he, Donald Trump was originally going to appear in Wall Street. There was a scene with, between him and Gordon Gecko because, you know, he's been, a, yeah. he's been a New York sort of figure for a long time. Absolutely. And uh, he shot this scene with Donald Trump. And he said after every take, Donald Trump would jump up out of his chair and say, wasn't that great? And and he realized like he can, he went ahead and finished the scene, but he knew as soon as he was done that this was not going to be in the movie because Trump was terrible. Right. You know, he yeah. was terrible, and he wouldn't take direction, no. which I, I think is probably a common theme throughout his life. He, mm -hmm. I don't think Donald Trump is a guy who takes direction from anybody. I was just yeah, I was just listening to a podcast about uh, that was talking about the seven insecurities of Donald Trump, and one was even one was definitely was a sexual one. Right. Because he has to surround himself with, you know, beauty pageant women and, and models yeah. and constantly to show show off. And, you know, it was just and he has a lot of insecurities about every, almost everything, you know, it seems like. Uh, yeah, but I will say as much as he doesn't like Donald Trump and thinks he's he thinks he's incompetent as well. You know, he doesn't just disagree with him politically. He thinks he's incompetent and unqualified, but he doesn't he doesn't like Hillary Clinton either. I understand. And he really resents that he's going to have to hold his nose and vote for Hillary Clinton because he thinks Hillary Clinton like her husband are essentially uh, Republicans in Democratic clothing, like mm -hmm. milder versions of Republicans, and he feels that way about the modern Democratic Party. And it's sure. so funny when like I see the right-wing press describe Oliver Stone as um a shill for the Democrats, it's like, you obviously don't know much about him because he hates them, too. Right. Like, he's disappointed. Like, he hates the Republicans, but he's deeply, profoundly disappointed of yeah. the Democrats. Exactly. And he was a Bernie Sanders man. Mm -hmm. He was 100% a Bernie Sanders man, and he was very disappointed that he didn't get the nomination. And he still talks about that. The book, yeah. 100 Hours, you mentioned, I mean, the book is not just, it's, it's not a filmography. This is much more um, nuanced because it's so much more about his ideology as well and his what's on his mind and his yeah i'm wondering how much of a collaborator he was in the book well what happened was um i interviewed oliver for the first time in uh 2001 on the phone when i was writing a story for the star ledger about the psychological effects of uh, the World Trade Center attack footage being replayed over and over. This was about a week after 9-11. And uh, I interviewed a number of people, and he was one of them, and he got the closing quote in the story, which was, people who have never experienced violence before have experienced it now. Which is a characteristically terse, you know, gut punch kind of statement. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't speak to him again for nine years. Mm -hmm. I talked to him again in 2010 when Wall Street Money Never Sleeps came out. We were supposed to have a 20-minute interview at the Bloomberg News Building where he was, you know, set up. And it ended up going for an hour because he enjoyed talking to me. And his assistant kept coming in and saying, Oliver, we have somebody else waiting. But, he, but the fact that I actually knew his movies and was asking him about filmmaking made him want to keep talking. And at the end of it, I invited him to uh, present Nixon and Alexander at the Museum of the Moving Image, and he said he would love to do that, and that actually happened, you know, uh, probably six months, uh, four months later. Mm -hmm. And um, the transcript of that discussion forms the core of the Alexander chapter of the book. And, um, and then after that, I interviewed him again when um, Savages came out in 2012, and I interviewed him when New York University gave him an honorary uh, doctorate because he went to NYU and he studied film under Martin Scorsese after he got out of Vietnam. And so I looked at it and I realized, okay, I've got four interviews with Oliver Stone and I like him and he seems to like me, so maybe this could be the next film book. The Wes Anderson collection had already come out by that point. Right. And I talked to him about it and he said, I would love to do that. 
and he and he and I began interviews almost immediately before I even had a deal to do the book. Like nobody had said yes to us yet, and he said, "Let's get started," right. well, which I thought was remarkable. And um, and the publisher uh, Abrams has been great, but they took some convincing at the beginning because you know I, I'm not telling anybody anything they don't know, but. Oliver Stone's peak period was 1986 through 1996, which is roughly Salvador through Nixon. Mm-hmm. And he's had some ups and downs. You know, he's had some hits and some flops. And, you know, any given Sunday and World Trade Center did ex- exceptionally well. And World Trade Center, I was shocked to find out, is his third highest grossing movie. That is I didn't know that. Yeah. I think, And it's mainly conservatives who loved it, oddly. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's he's not a hot out. director. He's right. not a hot director. But the funny thing is, Wes Anderson wasn't at the time that I got the green light to do that book. Mm-hmm. That was summer of 2009 before the fantastic Mr. Fox had come out. So his last two movies were Moonrise Kingdom and the Darjeeling Limited. And the, and the, right. the feeling at the publishing house was the same, which is like, why do you want to do a book about this guy? His last two movies flopped. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, Oliver uh, trusted in me from the very beginning, and we did two or three interviews before I had a deal. And then um, the publisher said yes, Mm -hmm. and I said, it's official, we can do this book. And he said, okay, but here's the thing. Like, I don't want any financial interest in the book, and I don't want any editorial control over the book. And I, I was stunned by that. And I said, why? Like, why the hell would anybody say that? And he said, because I feel like it's the only way that I can be honest with you. And so we signed an agreement to that effect. Mm. And there were, you know, little caveats in there, like, you know, he, he wanted to be able to at least look over the manuscript, and if he saw anything that he thought was factually inaccurate or, or just that he objected to, he, that I would, uh, in good faith, address those things. Mm-hmm. But um, he, uh, he gave me carte blanche. I mean, it was, this is like an unauthorized biography of Oliver Stone that he happened to participate in, which mm-hmm. is really weird. Mm-hmm. And he had his assistants go into storage and bring out his archives, which date back to 1971. Mm -hmm. And they're stored in a storage locker in Los Angeles, which is where Ixlon Productions, his production company, is headquartered. In a storage room. Yeah. It's a storage locker, yeah. And I've told him over and over, like, you got to digitize these things, man. Like, it really, it's actually really, really bothersome to me that they're not digitized. These are the only copies, or at least donate them to a university or something. But But it seems like that would be appeal to him. That part. That part, yeah. But not not digitizing necessarily. I mean, he probably knows it intellectually, but he does. But he can't be bothered. He he likes the physical. He likes the physical documents, and and yeah. But he told me the other night. He said nobody has ever had access to my archives before, which I didn't know until Mm -hmm. the book was already out. But um, it was great, and they're very well organized. I have to say. And they're, then they move chronologically through his life, and his first film as a director was Seizure, which is a low-budget, you know, not very good by his own admission horror film that came out in 1973, which starred... Er, the biggest star was Jonathan Frid from... Uh, oh, sure, Dark Shadows. Dark Shadows, and yeah. Irve Viachez, later known as Tattoo. Fantasy Island. Right. Yeah, that plan. <laughs> yeah, and there's like, three, there's like three or four boxes Can of materials on Seizure, including... Um, there's almost a half of a box that is um, records, uh, financial records of mm-hmm. seizure, which was incredible to me because I've, you know, I've directed my own, you know, I directed a feature and a bunch of shorts. Have you? Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. My my first and so You're far only man. my first and only feature film was called Home, and it got a, the, a, a theatrical release and won the theater in New York in 2006. Which theater. Uh, the uh, Two Boots Pioneer Theater, which, which sure. no longer it was exists. In the basement under Two Boots Pizza. It was, and I think that, I think there were like forty seats or something. Hey, listen. Uh, yeah, there's still there's like around the corner here, not too far, is the uh, Pioneer. Have you been there? It's a uh, storefront theater, which I don't even think has that many seats in it. I'm you not. know, I wonder if that's the same theater where I saw Stan Brackage's four-hour cut of Dog Star Man. Well, I can't imagine where else would have shown that. So I don't know where possible. else it would be, but oh, that was an incredible experience. The, that could be show at the archive, uh, the, you know, the uh, uh, anthology. Film yeah, archives, yeah, I suppose, but not too many other venues. Well, anyway, he uh, what he said was, you know, where do you want to begin? And I said, well, let's begin at the beginning. And he said, well, tell me what films you want, and and I'll have people from my company go into the storage locker and bring them out. And so they brought out, you know, it started with Seizure and his 1981 film The Hand, starring Michael Caine. Right. Right. And we worked our way forward from there. And, the, and it was great because these things were subdivided by, you know, there were actual physical production 
boxes, like when they were shooting. Mm -hmm. There were prep prepara preparation stuff. There were boxes of scripts, like every draft of every screenplay he's written is in there. And I and I reproduced some pages of that in the right, book. Right. Like you know, I have pages from his original script of Conan the Barbarian, which is amazing. Which he wrote. Amazing, yeah. which he wrote, and and uh, that was rejected because they said we have no way to do the the kind of special effects that this is demanding. It was basically it was an R-rated R, uh, uh, Ray Harryhausen mm -hmm. Sinbad film, mm -hmm. and he was at one point he's battling these this like shape shifting Cthulhu demon and an army of zombies and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. great. Like mm -hmm. I kind of wish that that version of the film existed. Right. And uh, and so we went through it, and I got my friend David Lambert, who's an illustrator and screenwriter in L.A. He helped me because I realized as I was going through this, there was so much stuff. There were like thousands of documents and photos, and there were telegrams. There was a telegram from Cher congratulating on, J on JFK. There were makeup tests. Uh, you know, John Malkovich was originally going to play Nixon. Wow, that is yeah. And there's photographs of him in makeup with prosthetic makeup to make his nose look more Nixonian, and, he, and I'll be damned if he doesn't look exactly like Nixon in really? that. And he backed out at the last minute. I think he felt like he wasn't the right guy for the part or something. Yeah. And uh, there's a t there's a letter from Harrison Ford's agent passing on the role of Jim G Jim Garrison and JFK. Mm -hmm. Um, just all kinds of stuff. And uh, there was an ent of two full boxes of letters written to him after JFK came out from people who wanted, who, you know, there were three kinds of letters in there. One was, congratulations, you're a great patriot, thank you for exposing this conspiracy, and the alternate version, which is, damn you, you fucking traitor. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. how dare you, you liberal, right. blah, blah, blah. Yeah, right. And then the second yeah. kind of letter was... Um, I know something about the Kennedy assassination. I want to share it with you. And mm -hmm. it was like people from who were there in Dealey Plaza that day, and there were also people just from all over the world saying, "Have you have you investigated this? Have you investigated that?" And then the third group, which was really fascinating, was people. The third group, which was really fascinating, was people who wanted him to take on some other conspiracy. Like your next film should be about RFK, or your next film should be about who killed Marilyn Monroe. And there were several letters about Elvis, and there were a number of letters about UFOs. Like, can you please mm -hmm. investigate the UFO phenomenon? And there was one rather long letter, and I wanted to reproduce it in the book, but we couldn't put everything in it. It was written on a piece of what looked like cardboard ripped out of the side of a box, and it was written in a black Sharpie, but the important words were written in red Sharpie. And it was the front and back of, like, a jagged, torn-out piece of cardboard. Mm -hmm. And it was all about UFOs. And it was this guy saying that I was abducted. I was abducted and probed. And Oliver Stone, can you please tell my story? It was unbelievable. Yeah. So he trusted me with all of this stuff. And um, the book took, I would say the bulk of the writing of the book took two years. And during that time, I, uh, I went out to Los Angeles, I don't even know how many times, 15, 20 times. Really? Yeah. And uh, and I went to his apartment in New York because he's, you know, bi-coastal. Mm -hmm. um, and the first draft of the book was 880 pages long. And the publisher said, uh, no. well, my editor <laughs> said, I love all this stuff, but we can't put it out an 880-page, 12-pound book that costs $250. You know, like, yeah. you got to bring it down. And so we had to cut it in half. And we lost a lot of stuff in the process that I thought was really great. Um, but you know the current book is almost 500 pages, so I don't any, I don't think anybody complain can complain that we weren't thorough. Right. But it also seems like you you could have a companion website or something which would have a lot of. Content. Well, we talked about that, but the, okay. you know the the, the, pro so the problem with that was um, who is going to who right. is going to put that up? To develop the site and to maintain it and all that. Yeah. Well, he actually it's funny because I I busted Oliver's chops many times about the fact that there's four cuts of Alexander. Mm -hmm. And he started returning the favor by saying, like, when are you going to do the director's cut of this book, Matt? When are you going to do the longer version? <laughs> and he said, and one time he said to me, like, if you think you're not going to go back and revise this book, you're kidding yourself. Jeez. And, of course, I'm already thinking about things I should have done differently. Right. Well, who doesn't? Had, yeah, had that level of involvement. I mean, during the Wes Anderson stuff, have you, did, did, how, how involved was Wes Anderson? Wes was not. Uh, Wes was involved in the sense that he contributed interviews and and he provided a lot of materials. Mm -hmm. And that book, the only reason that that book got done at all, because you know intellectual property is is the single biggest problem that I face when I'm making these books, because they're driven by images. Mm -hmm. 
And the Grand Budapest Hotel book was not so difficult because probably 80% of the images in that book come from a single place, which is the Grand Budapest Hotel. Mm -hmm. And so we only had to go to one place, and it's filmed, you know, it's a film by the person that the book is about. So he could just say, give Matt whatever he wants, and I didn't have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. But other stuff, that's not the case. Like, you got to pay for, like, if you want to, you know, an image from Star Wars, you got to get permission. An image from Disney. An image from, like, the Charlie Brown. We reproduced Charlie Brown uh, images, peanuts, from the animated specials in the Wes Anderson collection, and we had to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And we had to run them small, because if we ran them big, it would have cost a lot more money. Oh, really? And, you know, it's an an incredible amount of uh, time, and it's very, very tedious. Like, it's not the fun part, is uh, contacting people and saying, hey, can we please have this? Oh, that's really a lot of money. Can we? Can you please charge us less? And if they aren't, you have to find another solution. Right. And, uh, it sounds the, like making a film, and you know the soundtrack. And it is, or, yeah. or a documentary, probably. Yeah. yeah. Like if you want news footage from CNN or NBC or mm-hmm. whatever, you have to pay for it. And uh, this, the Oliver Stone book, I, I didn't have too many problems with that ultimately because so much of the material came from you know, his personal files. Mm-hmm. And Ixlon Productions is technically the author of all of his films, so it wasn't like I had to go ask permission from 20th Century Fox to use images from Born on the Fourth of July. Mm-hmm. But there were personal photographs of uh, mainly news photos that I had to pay for because they came from the Associated Press or they came from Reuters or somewhere sure. like that. The yeah. Daily News charged me like $500 to, to run a... Uh, 300 word story about Nixon you know there's a clipping in his files that I thought was cool so Mm -hmm. I wanted to run that and we have photos of and you know I have to say you know this book is aesthetically just really different from the uh, Wes Anderson books because Wes doesn't talk about his personal life he certainly doesn't talk about politics he doesn't talk about history Mm -hmm. Oliver does and I wanted to illustrate all that stuff so when he's talking about how when he was in NYU um, Martin Scorsese had him participating in the in the filming of a documentary program, uh, a documentary film about the student protests in the wake of the Kent State shootings in 1971. Mm-hmm. And one key sequence in that movie is with the so-called hard hat riots, which occurred on Wall Street. Anti-war protesters went down there to protest the war, and there were construction workers who were doing work down there, and they got into a fight with the protesters, and they started beating the crap out of them. Mm -hmm. And there's photos of this. So I thought, like, we have to have a photo of this. This is an important part of that chapter. Right. And so I got an AP photo, and I think that costs like 250 bucks, mm-hmm. whatever. Almost um, negligible, but not quite, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, he talks about in the Any Given Sunday chapter, it turns out to be mainly about race relations in mm-hmm. the United States, like, mm-hmm. you know, as it relates to football, but also how it relates to American life. Because when I asked him about Jim Brown, who uh, was an NFL football star who became an actor and who is in the movie as Al Pacino's assistant coach, Um, He went into this beautiful monologue about Jim Brown and how important Jim Brown was to America in the 60s and 70s. And it's like, all right, so obviously part of this book is going to be about Jim Brown. And I got a photo of him at a press conference with Muhammad Ali and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And uh, that was an AP photo, and that cost money. And like, you, you can't say to the Associated Press, hey, can you let this have this for for nothing? Because they'll laugh at you. Right. Yeah. So, you know, so there was all that kind of stuff. But uh, it is like making a film. Mm-hmm. It is like making a film. And and I always tell people that these mo- these books are movies. And I often I refer to these books as movies. Like, I often make the Freudian slip of saying, well, you know, the next movie I do. Yeah. <laughs> and they are conceived that way. Like, mm-hmm. you know, both of the West You look Ant- at them cinematically. I way. do. Yeah. I look at them because I'm trying to reflect the sensibility of who, whatever, whoever or whatever the book is about. And that's why the Wes Anderson collection and the, and the Grand Budapest Hotel book are in the spirit of or in the style of a Wes Anderson film. And Mad Men Carousel is a uh, hardback text-driven book that is deliberately designed to look like a book from about 1971. And there are these stylized illustrations in it that look like yeah. something that would run in, like, the Saturday Evening Post. Mm-hmm. And um, the uh, the Oliver Stone experience is supposed to be like an Oliver Stone film. So there's a mix of... It's not just images from his movies. There's images from his life. Mm-hmm. And there's images from history. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got a photo of in the section on the, the 70s uh, right up to the point when he wrote Midnight Express, 
there's an image of the bicentennial celebration in New York City, mm-hmm. which he which he was there for. And in the 1976, uh, in the section of the book that is set in 1976, July 4th, um, bicentennial, that was an important moment, and he talks about that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wanted to find a picture to illustrate that moment in his life, and I found this beautiful photo of fireworks erupting over lower Manhattan, and you see the intact World Trade Center towers. Mm. And that was, I think, I don't remember if that was Associated Press or Reuters, but we had to pay for that. And then there's a campaign button for Jimmy Carter, who he voted for, and that comes from his files. Oh, okay. You know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, it's, so, so, so it's definitely all these like... channels. I it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. And it's just okay. like, you know, like, again, it's like an Oliver Stone movie where you watch The Doors, and there's a sequence in The Doors, and we reproduce uh, still frames from that where Jim Morrison, who's obviously stoned out of his mind on something, is channel surfing through the news... And it's not really the news. It's almost like an expressionist or impressionistic uh, version of the news where every time he changes the channel, there's a different historical atrocity. Right. There's Martin Luther King giving the, his I Have a Dream speech and then images of the balcony in Memphis where he was shot. There's the, there's the, image, the famous image of that young girl from the Vietnam War who'd been napalmed running down the street. There's the moon landing, all of that stuff. And... Um, and he does that. He'll, like, cut in historical footage or news footage into his movies. Yeah. And I thought, like, the book needs to do that, too. Interesting. Did you have a, a, did you have a favorite Oliver Stone film? Born on the 4th of July. Really? Without question. Yeah. Born on the 4th of July, I think, is the closest to a perfect film that he's ever made. And also, that's a film that I find tremendously moving mm-hmm. still. Like, I can't even talk about that movie for any length of time without getting choked up. Like, that's how much that movie means to me. And it's not just because I was an extra in the film and got my head knocked in. <laughs> yeah, well, you're gonna have you to know, I got, revisit that anecdote. You know, because. beaten. I got. Uh, I played a uh, protester in that movie. I was a young Republican. Well, you were supposed to be a hippie. I was supposed to be a hippie, but I, but I, uh, I had long hair and a beard when they cast me, and then I got a girlfriend in between then and when they shot, and and I went home to meet her parents, and she said, "You can't meet my parents looking like this." So I got a shave and a haircut. And, and they ca- <laughs> yeah, they cast me as a young Republican, but I decided that I was a young Republican who realized the error of his ways and suddenly was pro hippie. And uh, I got chased by an actor who was playing a National Guardsman and uh, beaten with a billy club in the parking lot behind the administration building at S- at, N- at uh, SMU. This must have been this guy who was beating you. Must have uh, studied under Stella Adler <laughs> or or Lee. You know, well, there was a uh, kind of a method Strasburg, aspect. Yeah, it was like because he he really took it like seriously and um, it got quite lost in the. Well, role. they 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 we all did. I mean, mm-hmm. like it was a lot really, of people. Was there like was a that? lot of people in that sequence, and they had second assistant directors who were in charge of different groups of extras, and there was one assigned to the Vietnam veterans against the war who were giving speeches and throwing their medals into a crowd. Mm-hmm. There was another one who was in charge of the young Republicans, another one who was in charge of the hippies, and they were. There were uh, another one in charge of the National Guard, and the National Guard was broken into two groups. One of them had foam rubber billy clubs, and they were the ones who were supposed to beat the protesters, and the others had real billy clubs, and they're the ones that you see in that sequence wrapping their clubs menacingly on their shields. Mm -hmm. And um, at a certain point, you know, they, they, they were whipping us all into a frenzy, and they were showing us propaganda materials, and they gave us cheat sheets where it's like, here's period slang from the 60s, here's what you're supposed to yell at the people you hate. I mean, yeah. and they really, and they were really working on our minds. And like, by the time it, we came to shoot that scene, we fucking hated everybody else who wasn't us. Yeah, it was amazing, and that's what happened. And this guy who was playing the National Guardsman, he really hated me. He really hated it's me. Like this Stanford, what was it called? The, the, the Stanford, Stanford prison, prison experiment. Prison experiment. That's it's what almost, it was like. Yeah, <laughs> that was it what it was like. like. That. Yeah, and um, yeah. So I think um, probably. Uh, it's weird. It's like weird that I have this sort of personal biographical connection to his movies, but a lot of it comes from being in Dallas. <laughs> right. And uh, he shot four films in Dallas, Talk Radio, Born on the Fourth of July, JFK, and Parts of Any Given Sunday. So he, has, he actually has a relationship there, and um, I love the fact that he had a relationship there because um, he was a dangerous filmmaker at that time, and there were a lot of people in Dallas who didn't like the fact that this carpetbagger from New York this liberal, you know, troublemaker Former was coming into their town. Door. Yeah, and like, and I told him that, and he said, I didn't have any sense of that, but then I was dealing with the creative community in Dallas. 
Yeah, he was sort of in a bubble in a way. Yeah, yeah, he was. But, uh, but, but yeah. it's interesting. I think I mentioned to you last night, I also had heard that Tom Cruise, who was nominated for Oscar for Best Actor in that movie, certainly would have been, if he had won, the youngest actor to win. Yes. Because there have been younger, younger females, as we noted. But it's, And it's surprising because he must have been... Close to 30. I mean, I was thinking, how old was he? No, he was, at the time, he was, I believe, 27. Okay, so that's not too... Yeah, it's relatively close to... Anyway, anyway... you know Al Pacino was going to play that part originally. Is that That, true? That film was going to be made in the 1970s, and uh, I believe Daniel Petrie was going to direct it. Oliver wrote the script with Ron Kovic, who it's about. Right, Ron. Mm -hmm. And um, funding fell through. Funding fell through, and it was devastating for, for Oliver and for Ron Kovic. But it was originally going to be Al Pacino, who at the time was, I believe, uh, 38. And he talks about that in the book, and he talks about how um, Pacino, he said Pacino's performance was great. It was great, and he, and he always wanted to see that version of it. But then he got to make it again later, and it's, I think it's a great film. Mm-hmm. But that, but in addition to you know rejoining my thought, which escaped me, which is that movie is uh, great in terms of its use of symbols, but also its emotional power, mm-hmm. and I think it's also a great portrait of what trauma does to you. And that moment where Ron Kovic returns home in his wheelchair, mm-hmm. and his parents and his siblings and his neighbors come out and they all greet him and they all say to him, "Ronnie, you look great. You look great." Mm-hmm. They keep saying that over to over to him, "You look great." He doesn't look great, and he doesn't feel great, and that devastates me every time I see it, that scene. Mm. You know, and I told Oliver, I said, this film, like, what I love about this film is it's an anti-war film. It's an anti-war film generally and an anti-Vietnam film specifically, but I think it speaks beyond that. You know, I think it speaks to anybody who has realized at a certain point, I'm not the person I thought I was. I'm somebody else. It's having everything stripped from you and to get to the core yeah. person, person. And so it's in a way, even though it's tragic, it's also an opportunity to be his most authentic self, which he develops into and fortunately survives that transition. Yes. And, and, now Ron, and then it becomes Ron Kovic, who we know and who's a real hero and has made really so much out of his life in terms of his books and his public appearances and his influence overall as a, you know, just a... They gave us that, uh, we have an excerpt from Born on the Fourth of July in the book, and Ron Kovic, uh, we got that for almost nothing. I mean, you, I think they would probably charge shoot the nose for that, because that's a national abor- award-winning book that was the basis of a hit film, but we got it because, you know, he loves Oliver. Mm-hmm. And uh, his, uh, the people who, rep- who represented the rights on that, I talked to them on the phone, and I said, what do you, so what do you want for this? And they said, like, what seems fair to you? <laughs> <laughs> that's a gr- that's a nice thing to hear. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. It is. Um, what well, do you know what Oliver's does he have a favorite of his own or do you think? He doesn't. He said it's like choosing among his children and well, I hear that a lot, but right. but I, I know it seems that like, yeah, um reasonable enough. I know that the one that he talks about the most is a film that he feels is really repres- there are two films that he feels are really representative, most representative of who he is. Mm-hmm. And they, in his opinion, haven't been properly appreciated yet. One of them is the documentary series Untold History, which he did for Showtime. Mm -hmm. And he actually says in the book, I believe that this series is the fullest representation of who I am at this point in my life. And the other one is Nixon. Mm -hmm. And he, he thinks, and I think he's right, that that is maybe the fullest flowering of that style that he developed in the middle part of his right. career that he really it began with Born on the Fourth of July and the Doors, it really broke out with JFK. Mm-hmm. And then by the time he got to Nixon, I think he had made it a much more subtle, much more expressive style. And I love the fact that that movie is a Freudian stew of all of these conflicting elements and there's like there's news, there's history, there's biography it jumps through like five or six, I don't even know how many periods of his life, and it's basically like you're inside the head of Richard Nixon for the duration of that film, which is not necessarily a pretty place to be, but it's really interesting. Mm-hmm. And that movie cost, I don't know, $45, $50 million to make. The only reason it even got made is because there was some kind of weird contractual thing that he had with Disney 
that allowed him to make it. Like, I think he was supposed to make another film. He tried to explain this to me four different times, like yeah. what it was in this contract that allowed him to make it. And I, and I never could understand the particularities of it, so I left it out of the book. But he only got it made because of this weird clause in some agreement he had with Disney and because Anthony Hopkins wanted to play Nixon. That's the only he reason that film is this. coming off of a, this second wave in his career. Conference. Right, yeah, Silence, Silence of the Lambs, of the Lambs. Um, Remains of the Day, yeah. Howard's Aaron. End. He, yeah. he had like three Oscar nominations three yeah, years no, in a row. it was an incredible arc in his career at that time. It was great. And that movie and came Nixon. out, and it, and it bombed. It made yeah. you know, like $13 million, and he's still devastated by that. And he thinks it's a way better film than what won that year, which is, uh, I think, Braveheart. And uh, I think... He's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned last night also the scores and how that was really, you know, an effective uh, component of his films. And I was doing a little quick research um, on that. And I know early on he collaborated quite a bit with John Williams. Yeah, he did. Who was a very ubiquitous uh, composer for film. Uh, yes. As we know from, epic, from a number of, uh, uh, you know. Maybe you want, maybe you want to yeah, put a pin in it for a second. I didn't know the Hells Angels had a clubhouse here. <laughs> Seems so. Um, anyway, I think so it's probably more likely a dentist. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> I was reminiscing with somebody actually, I think also last night, about how it, as a kid just walking, in, you know, like in the East Village and high school, whatever, college, and just if I knew I was coming up through a East 3rd Street where their clubhouse was, you know, I was had, there was such a, you know, this myth mythology about around the Hells Angels how violent they were so you know it, it kind of worked they, they these guys were mostly pretty well they were hardcore partiers or hard you know in some ways but I'm sure it was a way exaggerated uh, right in terms of the violence but uh, since uh, the, let's say the 60s or something what we were talking about the the score. So I know that he worked to collaborate quite a bit with John Williams and uh, and more recently of course, has had a number of other composers he's collaborated with, correct? Yeah. But, but what were your thoughts on that? And you know, well, in terms of the scores and how did that had it some some impact on your? It your it did. I I love his use of music in in films, and I think he's somebody who you know you think of great use of music, you think of people like uh, Martin Scorsese, Hal Ashby, Wes Anderson, Jonathan Demme, and I think they're all fantastic. But I think I love the way Oliver uses music. And the score, particularly, I think the John Williams scores are probably the best altogether. Um, Born on the Fourth of July, sure. JFK, mm -hmm. I think is great, and Nixon. Mm -hmm. I think his score for Nixon is one of the best things he's ever done, and I think that's particularly fascinating in relation to um, the films of Steven Spielberg, who also is dealing in history a lot of the time. And Spielberg and Oliver Stone are, in many ways, the inverse of each other. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they both use John Williams, and, and it's very illuminating when you hear the scores that John Williams was doing for Spielberg and listen to the ones he was doing for Stone at the same time. And there's, an, there's elements of irony and doubt and, and self-reflection in, in his work for Stone mm -hmm. uh, that you don't find in his work for Spielberg. And particularly in uh, Born on the Fourth of July, where it's, like a it's basically the, the soundtrack of a depressed patriot. Mm -hmm. And in Nixon, the fact that there's this uh, magnificent orchestral score, but it's mostly in a minor key, and it's always it almost sounds like a depressed person. It's melancholy. It is. It's like yeah. a it's like a depressed person trying to get through the day. Well, I always had that. I mean, I read a lot of books about Nixon, and my theory, which I think probably now pretty embraced, is that he was mentally ill. Possibly. Nixon. Yeah. Uh, you know, just. Uh, untreated, he was, you know, as the film depicts, he was self-medicating, right, uh, with, with 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 alcohol. Yeah, 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 yeah. and uh, crime, <laughs> right, <laughs> alcohol and crime. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I really think he was. I think he was. I mean, I don't even think it's a it's a strong way to describe it. I mean, I think it's it's probably true. Yeah, that he suffered from some level of psychosis and uh, untreated. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that definitely comes through in Williams' the score. Look at his. Look at his his childhood but yeah it's great and i also think but i also think his use of pop music is excellent and uh, as early as i think platoon was probably the movie where i noticed it for the first time but you know the use of the tracks of my tears and the scene where the soldiers are bonding together mm -hmm. in their in the barracks and um 
in um, Wall Street, uh, the original Wall Street, which has a score by Stuart Copeland, which is this great percussive score, which is almost like it's like to me mentally, it always sounds like a a, a money counting machine, mm-hmm. you know, like one of those yeah, bill yeah, counters yeah. or something, or like a a ticker tape. Like it's got that sort of like, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and then um, in. Uh, Natural Born Killers, I think, was a revolutionary in its in its in its use of pop music, which was curated by Trent Reznor, who also did original compositions for the movie, and that's an astounding mix of songs in that, um, and uh, everything from uh, Bob Dylan to uh, Leonard Cohen, mm-hmm. um, and any given any given Sunday is one that I think is great too because that one. It often expresses the different cultural values of the main characters. And often when you're seeing, seeing Al Pacino's character, the soundtrack is jazz. And there's a point where he actually, le- he, he kind of like white splains jazz to Jamie Foxx's quarterback on a mm-hmm. plane. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And Jamie Foxx is all about rap, and he actually right. raps. He cuts that. a novelty rap video. Uh-huh. And, um, and in the locker room, there's, you know, the majority black players on the team uh, and then there's these white players who are mainly uh, some linebackers, and they are sort of struggling over what they listen to in the locker room. And there's a scene where one of these big white defensive lines linemen puts on uh, like death metal, mm-hmm. and he's like, and he yells, "Bow down to the gods of rock!" <laughs> and you really see that, yeah, like that, ra- that sort of subordinated racial tension is reflected yeah. in the yeah, music sure. in the film. Right, sure, it's great. And there's actually a game where uh, there's a like a. A pretty hardcore rap song that suddenly gives way to uh, what is that song? Um, I'm blanking. It's a it's a rap. Anyway, there's a there's a scene there's a scene in one of the games where a, a pretty hardcore rap song gives way to like basically a '60s dinosaur rock song. Mm-hmm. And so even yeah. even even the uh, the cutting of the film is interweaving with the music in a way that expresses what the film is trying to show you. Mm-hmm. And uh, what did the music do they play in the doors? Uh, <laughs> were they? At, is that? I mean, I think it was Frank Sinatra. <laughs> uh, you hear so many stories. You know, Todd Haynes t- ran into twice. Uh, you know, getting rights for music. Right, first time with Todd Haynes uh, with Karen Carpenter with the Carpenters. Yeah. Second time with uh, Bill Bowie, David Bowie. Right. Right. Yeah. So w- with the doors, not the case. Yeah. No, well, the Doors. It's like you know, your your By the soundtrack. Way, Todd Haynes had more success with Bob Dylan. Let's later. Uh, yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. That he was, did. Uh, made up for it in a lot of ways. Yeah, Todd Haynes is also excellent with music, and I I'm really knocked out by the fact that he was able to do Velvet Goldmine. One of the hardest things to do when you're doing a story of fictional artists mm-hmm. who are living in the same time as giants in their field and who are in theory competing with them because mm-hmm. you got to come up with music that plausibly sounds like it could be a hit or at That's least true. like something that somebody would listen to right and a lot of times the movie just fails mm-hmm. and velvet goldmine didn't the, the music in that film actually sounds like of the period and something that people would like mm-hmm. that's that's really really hard i think spinal tap came close to <laughs> yeah, some really good songs yeah spinal it did tap. <laughs> it did um, it did yeah well, all those guys are musicians too, right. which helps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, the Doors, yeah, it's just amazing. So, there's how many films that has he made up to date, up through Snowden? Then his Snowden is his twentieth film. That's it. Yeah, I, it just sounds like. I guess we must have touched on almost every title. Because well, we did. We left out the yeah. documentaries, but uh, he's made uh, what is, is it? it? Three all films all about Fidel time. Castro, one film about the politics in the Middle East, and one film about. Um, the uh, destruction of leftist governments in South America, and then he made Untold History. I don't know right. if that... I guess technically that's a TV series, mm-hmm. but um, he's making a film about Vladimir Putin right now. Is that right? Which I'm sure everyone's going to really, really that's like him for. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, depending on how it comes out, the um, pre- the um, Donald Trump, too, might have something to say, I suppose, since he yeah. seems to be trying to buddy up with uh, Putin. I have to go to the bathroom. To yeah, yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah. We, and then we can wind down, too. Just, uh, okay. Yeah, probably. Go ahead. i got to see who this is. Well, in the meantime, I can at least remind people that the uh, book uh, is called <laughs> The Oliver Stone Experience. It's, being pub- it's published by Abrams, and it is c- currently available where books are sold. The movie... 
the new Oliver Stone movie is called Snowden, currently in theaters as we uh, record this podcast segment, um, starring Jonathan Gordon Levitt in the title, the titular, as they say, role. <laughs> and uh, I love to say that. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, Beavis, and Beavis and Butthead should snicker at that. <laughs> he said, it's <laughs> titular. <laughs> it's, it's great. I mean, I um, so is this number 20? Is that what you said? 20th the film, feature, yeah. His, 20th, the, the his 20th feature, features. yes. Right, gotcha. Okay. Um, and uh, he's ar- and he, he's working on a Putin film of, of a narrative, I guess. Yeah, it's a documentary. Oh, it is? It's oh. a documentary, oh, yeah. He's actually been spending power, time though. with That's Putin. Hanging with Putin, who you know? Yeah, the, and it's just—it's almost like you know he doesn't. He certainly never thinks of it this way. But like, if you look at it from far, it's like—is he just trying to antagonize conservatives in the United States? Mm. Although I think everybody's afraid of Putin right now. Uh, he's like he's yeah. like the Joker. He's like this sinister figure yeah, that every right. everyone's freaking out time, over. I mean, the first time I laid eyes on him, he, the, he just—I 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 felt this is a guy, like a snake. I just—I just had this feeling. I just knew there was something up with this guy. Well, there's a reason why he and Trump have a mutual admiration society. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. Business. But Oliver has a, 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 his perspective on Russia, and I can't, I just can't even fathom thinking this way, but his attitude about Russia, China, and everybody else is, they all have their reasons for doing things. Mm -hmm. And the best strategy is he would like it if every country on the earth stayed out of everybody else's business. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well. A passing ice cream truck. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, every, everything is going to I don't make think, can way. I just say that I don't think I'm going to, I can't see myself buying ice cream from a truck that plays La Cucaracha. <laughs> 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 we'll build a wall around this ice cream truck. Uh, but the, the uh, um, what was I going to say? Something probably around the this idea of, of like countries just sort of take care of their you know self self determined destinies and all that something to it yeah that was one of the things he talked about with me in the chapter on untold history he said that from our perspective the expansion of the Soviet Union after World War II looks like this menacing octopus spreading its tentacles over the globe but a lot of the comp- a lot of the countries that they invaded and seized in their in their opinion they were simply reclaiming their rec- basically protecting their borders creating a uh, creating a buffer zone around their borders so that they would have uh, less likelihood of getting invaded and attacked again like they were in World War II by the Nazis mm-hmm. and that's not something that you're ever going to hear in an American history book Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how I feel about it. I'm not sure that I necessarily agree with it, but I do think that he has a point when he says that ideology is often a cover for much more naked kind of self-interest. Mm-hmm. You know that, and that's something that he talks about in Untold History, and also that is tangential in a lot of his historical films. This is this idea that in Born on the Fourth of July, JFK, Nixon, and Heaven and Earth, his third Vietnam film. Um, there are all of these ideological reasons being presented for war, but ultimately the films portray them as being about resources and power and cultural dominance. Right. And um, Untold History sort of lays this out over the course of, you know, ten, what is it? I can't remember if it's 10 or 12 chapters. It was originally longer, and Showtime made him cut it, but I think he restored it for the DVD. But he follows U.S. history and particularly the interaction of the United States and other countries over a period of uh, more than a century. Mm-hmm. And one of the things he keeps coming back to is that it, whether it's anti-communism or the war on terror, that a lot of times the case that's presented to people in the United States is we have to protect ourselves, we have to defend ourselves, we have to fight these people who are trying to destroy us. And there may be some truth to that on some level, but a lot of times it's really being used as a pretext to Sell more arms, grab some land, grab some resources, and or even um, as comes up, it's just some old, uh, what would you call it? Like a like a, you know some some old wrong that that somebody feels like they have to rectify. You know, yes. it's it's interesting. It's like you know they talked about Bush Senior being, you know, humiliated and you know and defied, and then it, so this was, you know, W's 
revenge. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, there was another example of that real recently. Well, and he flat out said they tried to kill my dad. Right. Yeah. Oh, right. There was a, the, 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 assassination uh, the assassination attempt, attempt on, 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 Bo- on Bush the Elder. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and also the criticism against his father for not having gone all the way to Baghdad and, and toppled Saddam Hussein. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's a sense of the the son trying to out outdo the father or do things or, better than his father. Uh, well, right, we're maybe wrapped in this idea of, which is all, all in of itself offensive, but you know, I like trying to make things equal and, and or get right. exacting revenge on some level, right. which in and of itself is sick. Yes. But it, it, you could somehow kind of present that as some sort of rationale. Well, he, know, Oliver talks about that a lot. Yeah. He talks about this idea of how when you talk about getting even, what you're actually talking about is destroying someone. Yeah. And he talks about this in relation to 9-11. He says, you know, there were a handful of terrorists who hijacked planes and they destroyed two buildings in New York and killed, mm-hmm. you know, almost 3,000 people mm-hmm. and sent the economy and, and the... And the uh, foreign policy into disarray but you know we killed many 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 more people in two different countries as a result of that and we and we still feel like when things are not equal Mm -hmm. like we haven't even the scales yet Mm -hmm. and he talks about that in relation to the end of world war ii it's like why was it necessary to destroy two cities filled with civilians with nuclear weapons at the end of world war ii well you know of course howard zinn's theory because we were getting back for pearl harbor that and also, uh, right, one bomb was uranium and the other one was, uh, 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 one was uranium and the other was uh, uh, hydrogen. Is that right? right? The hydrogen bomb? Well, the hydrogen right? bomb came later. Okay, so it wasn't, it was, a t- one was uh, uranium, oh, there were two kinds of, I'm going to forget now, but, um, and that, you know, but it seems too, a little too pat in a s- really sick way, like that would be the reason for well i don't think he doesn't mean it's only he doesn't mean it's only that but we but he talked about this in vietnam he said that the american military has a problem with um reasonable measured responses to aggression Mm -hmm. and one example he gave he talked about full metal jacket the final assault and full metal jacket he said was very true to his experience Mm -hmm. as an infantryman in vietnam he said there's one sniper up in a window Mm -hmm. who's shooting people right and because of the combination of the Marines, I think most soldiers' motto, never leave a man behind, mm-hmm. and the incredible heavy firepower that these guys were carrying. Like you see in the film, there's like individual shots ring out. Somebody maybe gets hit or maybe they don't, and they respond by opening up with M16s mm-hmm. and M60s and grenade launchers, and they're basically destroying buildings, destroying entire buildings because of this one sniper. And the idea of simply retreating and waiting them out never occurs to them because that's simply not the way things are done. Like, there's a code that's, that's not how you do things. Mm-hmm. And he says that the same mentality that you see in that sequence was at play in foreign policy after 9-11, mm-hmm. which is an, uh, an argument that I've never heard before, but it's the argument of a soldier. And a lot of, a lot of Oliver's uh, attitudes and mentality, I think, come out of his experience in Vietnam. And he gets, he kind of bristles a little bit when I say this because he doesn't want to be stereotyped as the Vietnam guy, even though he's made, you know, three films about it. But um, I think there's some truth to it. I definitely think that it continues to resonate, resonate and he still talks about it. Like mm-hmm. in appearances to promote Snowden, he's occasionally referred to his Vietnam experience as the point where he began to question the stories he'd been told, question authority, and to become disillusioned and to look for some other way to be. Uh, the other, the other th- comparison I wanted to make about uh, it was that one theory of why Donald Trump is running. Yeah, was because of the humiliation he he went through when Obama during you know the the, the press corps. What was that? Uh, the, you know, their annual, the White House correspondence correspondence dinner, dinner yeah. and how. You know, he was sitting there, unable to respond, while Obama basically humiliated him in front of all these people, uh, and that he decided at that point that, yeah, that's one theory. I believe it. Yeah, you know, people, <laughs> have, people yeah. have people have gone to war with armies or simply on an individual basis because of humiliation mm-hmm. or because they felt slighted or something. Yeah, you know, that's human nature, and that's why I'm concerned about Trump becoming president because I don't believe he can be trusted he to right. to not use his pa- to not use the power of the presidency to settle petty grievances. Right, right. Yeah, that he can't transcend the personal. Uh, right. It's everything's always you know. Personal. And I don't think I don't. He's think a he, child. 
I yeah, know. yeah, and I don't think Hillary is, you know, a perfect candidate or human being by any reason, by any stretch of the imagination. But I don't see her arbitrarily calling in an airstrike on somebody who insulted her. Yeah. <laughs> and then I always just also have another level of rationale to it. Also, I, I feel on its own symbolically, a woman is going to be president. That's important in a more philosophical level. You know, yeah. maybe not enough so for such a role but i mean i kind of feel like going from an african-american president to a female president anybody can run for president right if yeah finally, I think there great. Is a, you know it's an important fa- phase of that we're going through anyway uh i kind of wish it was elizabeth warren instead of her okay yeah but on, the, but on the other hand i don't think elizabeth warren could beat trump she, i think she was pretty i think handled herself pretty well at the convention though yeah you know and, uh, you know, when, when she was talking about it. She does, but, you yeah. know, Clinton Clinton has, in addition to two terms of experience as first lady, where, you know, people say, like, well, so what? She was the first lady. It's like, yeah, but she got to, If you got to to be by the side of the president of the United mm-hmm. States mm-hmm. nonstop for eight straight years, mm-hmm. you would be qualified to run for president. Yeah. Um, you know, like, right. that. you don't get any closer to power than that. Mm-hmm. And you don't think she was sitting there studying and taking notes, you know? Sure. Um, and then after that, Secretary of State. Yeah, right. You know, she's yeah. she's one of the most qualified candidates we've oh, ever for had sure. for president. For sure. um, but uh, I just hope we don't have. I just hope we don't have Trump. Do you feel like you've got a uh, got enough here? Oh, I got plenty. Yeah, okay. I got more than enough. We have an, a solid hour and fifteen minutes, I believe, of, right. of, of content here. This is great. Uh, thank you so much. I you know I think uh, I started, I emailed you some time ago. You're a busy guy. I mean, besides the, uh, I mean, obviously, film critic, uh, editor in chief for RogerHuber.com. You've got the, uh, the TV critic. By the way, just real quick. I mean, I just watched the night of. I watched the Stranger Things, of course. Uh, that was the. I think I had, it was. The it's the law. But, yeah. Uh, there's a few other series that I've kind of gotten caught up in the last. Is this kind of this phenomenon? What you're writing about and. It's a great time to be watching TV. Yeah. It's a great time to be writing about TV, and there's more TV on than I can watch, and it's my job. And that's just the scripted stuff. Like, yeah. if I was into sports, I'd really be up the creek, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's unbelievable. And, and I have to really parcel my time out carefully mm-hmm. to even keep track of things. Like, I can't watch... All of everything, and I and I included Stranger Things, which is not, I guess, I mean, I guess it's, it's, I don't know if that's under your purview. Uh, they have something that's on Netflix, but it is. I imagine it is. Yeah, I review everything. I review streaming shows, network cable, mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff. But I think um, I think it's a great I, I think it's a great time for television. It's not not a great time for mainstream movies. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's happening is I feel like a lot of American independent film. Values are migrating to television, and two of the best examples I've seen of that recently are both FX shows, Better Things by Pamela Adlin, who is a co-producer, yeah, and, and sometimes star She's of Louie. Really, right. She Tremendous. played his wife twice, or no, a girlfriend once, or his wife twice, once. As yes. Well. On, on, on the uh, HBO series, right? She played his wife in that. Oh, no, or Lucky, Lucky Louie. Oh, unlike the Lucky Louie. That's right. She right. did. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. And uh, the Donald Glover series Atlanta, which I think is terrific. Oh, wait. Yeah. And, uh, and he's the showrunner and star of that. And it's directed by uh, Hi- Hiro Murkai. I hope I'm saying his name right mm-hmm. or remembering it right. Who has never directed television before. He's a music video director. And the whole thing has this very deadpan, quiet kind of vibe to it. Yeah. It's a kind of show where I think people would watch and say nothing happens, but I don't think that's true. Uh-huh. And I'm seeing more and more people, particularly in the half-hour format, working like that. And I think that's what's happening. That's where independent film is now. Mm-hmm. It's on TV, and, and the fact that there are so many uh, kind of niche cable channels and streaming services means that people can actually make shows like this. Louie was a very inexpensive show to make. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it was often, and he, he served as... Um, he served as his own editor a lot of the time. Yeah. You know, he hired Susan Morris, who cut a lot of Woody Allen movies, and I think he fired her almost immediately because he was so attached to cutting stuff himself. And right. Soderbergh, who directed two seasons of he, The he Nick has every an episode. He doing all that stuff. Well, he does. You know, under a <laughs> yeah. pseudonym, he, he's his own DP, his right. own, and he's his own camera operator and his own editor. And I've seen him work. I've been to the set. Have I've you? seen him work, yeah. And it's unbelievable to watch this guy work because... 
he goes in, he's blocking the scene with the actors, they do a couple of run-throughs, and he starts shooting, and he had a rule, he said probably 90% of the scenes on the Nick were shot in three takes, in three shots. He said there are three shots, they're long takes, and he would figure out where do I want to be at the end of the first shot, and he would do usually three or four takes hmm. of that first shot in the sequence, and then he would mentally go, which one of those was the best? And that's what he would use to figure out where do I start with my camera on the next shot. Mm -hmm. And then he would do two or three or four takes of that, and then he would figure out which in his mind, say, I'm the editor, which of those takes was the best, and then he'd finish. And as a result, you know, people say, so how, how is yeah. it possible that he can be his editor, his own editor? And the mm -hmm. answer is because there's not a lot of editing. Mm -hmm. If you're if you're, if you're editing, editing in, on the fly, he's sort of in his yeah, mind. He's right editing right in his mind yeah. as he's shooting it, and so and yeah. it sounds it sounds kind of ridiculous when you hear it that mm -hmm. he edits. He can edit a, an episode of the Nick in the car on the way home from shooting it. Mm -hmm. But when you're shooting the way that he's shooting, you, you already have a, an edit list in your mind, sure. and so you're just laying stuff on the timeline, and that's it. Yeah, you know, and then you might tweak it a little bit, and you're done. And he said, like, you know, like I'll I'll edit the day's footage. It takes me an hour to two hours, and then I have dinner with my wife. It's remarkable. Yeah, it is remarkable, but it's also extremely efficient. Mm -hmm. Well, the only thing I think about it when I think about all the platforms and and and, and you know series that are going on on many different stations is is we come out of this p long period, on, you know, about seven eight years ago when this started. House of Cards, even going back further, maybe Sopranos. I, I think, you know, on HBO, where there's now a proliferation of, you know, I think the Sopranos was maybe, you know, the the seed of the, you know, this this idea, oh, TV can be as good as movies, the writing, the acting. Right. After that, there's just been so many series, and now I, I, I was just glad after like uh, eight or six, seven, eight years of, of the disappearance of actors on television, um, for any TV critic, I don't think you're writing for TV criticism then but it, I was. It had to be, oh you were I mean it had to be a kind of a drought period because you know there used to be sitcom like you know just hundreds of sitcoms on on broadcast television and they all sort of disappeared as did soap opera you know all this stuff when reality tv was sort of pro proliferating I remember that yeah and then you know fortunately it seems like now actors can get work again <laughs> there's so many actors working yeah. Because of this, you know, it's it's. A, I think it's a good thing. I I do too. I do too. So many great actors. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. I'm gonna let you eat your 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 food. It's a burger. It's really. It looks really good. Yeah, it is. The food here is quite good. Yeah. So good luck with the uh, with everything. And I'm not gonna ask you back for a little while. <laughs> <You've> <laughs> delivered. Delivered. Uh, You've you know, done enough. So you've done well. <laughs> it's great. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>